Hello. We're talking now with a very important figure in Wisconsin political history, a former governor, and also a former member of the State Assembly and majority leader of the State Assembly. Thank you very much for joining us, Governor Anthony Earle. Well, it's good to be here, John. Well, let's start at the beginning. You were born in Michigan and graduated from Michigan State. I don't that know if we start out with the bad part here. <laughs> How did you get to Wisconsin? Well, I was born and raised in the UP, and uh, I still have a lot of family up there. It's a wonderful place to grow up virtually impossible place to make a living. Hmm. So uh, when people would get out of school, they'd have a couple choices. They'd go down toward Detroit. The smart ones would head toward Wisconsin. <laughs> and uh, I lived in uh, Wausau after I finished school and the service and the whole business. Uh, friends of mine with whom I'd gone to high school said, oh, Wausau is a great place. It's full of expatriates from the UP. And it was <laughs> indeed. And that's how I got to Wisconsin. What did your parents do to earn a living up there? Were you? My dad ran a grocery store. Oh. Tommy Thompson and I used to compare notes. Both of us came from uh, families where the breadwinner was a grocer. That seems to be common in Wisconsin politics. Most yes. of our U.S. senators, yeah. for instance, uh, do you... Do you learn a work ethic out of that? Uh, well, Pat Lucy, I learned Pat Lucy sure. grew up above a store too. Yeah. Do you learn a work ethic from? Well, that? surely or? did. I mean, it was a it was a lot of work. This was before when I was growing up, before the days of supermarkets. So somebody would come in and they'd say, "I want uh, two pounds of this, and I want a gallon of this," and the uh, my dad and the other folks who worked with him would get it all together. It was a uh, it was a full time full time occupation, and during much of that. Uh, World War II was going on, so they had a fight with the ration, rationing and the whole business. And there were always people wondering if, uh, if they buttered him up, if they'd get a little extra sugar or whatever. So I learned integrity as well as a work ethic. <laughs> so you helped with all this, too, yeah. in the store. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, then you, uh, you went into the, there, our service. Tell, tell us about that. Well, at that again, reflecting the, the time, uh, was universal military training. So everybody uh, served. Unless you were physically... Yeah, still uh, had the draft. Yeah. yeah. And so while I was going to school, both as an undergraduate then to law school, my name got up to the top of the list, and it stayed there. And the uh, woman who ran the draft board, Liddy Conlock, would call me every once in a while. She said, don't forget now. You've got to let me know as soon as you're out of school. <laughs> you're going. And I, sure, yeah, I understood. <laughs> so my last year of law school, I joined the Navy uh, so as to have some control, I thought, over my destiny. I bought the business, uh, joined the Navy, see the world. I spent most of my time in Norfolk, Virginia. <laughs> so I was introduced to consumer uh, fraud. At the, <laughs> but, uh, but my Navy, my, my time in the Navy was really pretty nice. And that, after the Navy, I uh, moved to Wausau. Now, were you, you were already an attorney when you went into the Navy then? I was. I had graduated from law school. And, and where? I, University of Chicago, okay. and uh, uh, graduated from law school, wrote the bar exam in Minnesota. It was the first one that was offered in, in, a t in terms of time, and I thought I, I wanted to do that because if I had a chance, I wanted to do some judge advocate work in the Navy, and indeed I did. Uh, my second set of orders after I finished officer candidate school was to go to justice school, and uh, so I got some very good experience. So that was four years? Yes, it was. Right. Law in the military is not quite the same as it is in civilian life, right? No, but I'll tell you, the law in the military looked really good at that time because, as I said, I was in Norfolk, Virginia. In the Commonwealth of Virginia, one of the cases I had involved a young Filipino couple, couple, couple who were arrested and imprisoned uh, for miscegenation because although they were both... <coughs> Filipino, her birth certificate listed her as Spanish, his listed him as Filipino, and the authorities arrested him. And we finally unraveled it, got him transferred to Boston, and then she followed him with their children. But the Commonwealth of Virginia was no kiss for Christmas, I'll tell you. And the folks in the military who'd get in trouble would try to beat it out to the base to uh, surrender to the uh, oh, really? shore patrol before they would... Uh, submit to the tender mercies of the law enforcement. In the wow, so you actually prosecuted a miscegenation. I defended, defended yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and in this case, it was an Asian and white, if, if right. that, I yeah. mean, if not mixed race. And, and the Virginia <laughs> miscegenation statute was very 
precise, it was only a couple years after that that the Supreme Court threw out Virginia's miscegenation laws. Interestingly enough, the marriage in question was between an African American and a Native American. And uh, the Love, Lovely case, I think it was called, or Loveless, I forget the name of uh, the couple. And the U.S. Supreme Court threw it out, but uh, it was a different time then. <laughs> yeah, well, that was an interesting, usually you don't get cases like that no, in the military, no. do you? I mean, they're usually pretty dull. Well, yeah, <laughs> well, as I said, because Virginia was so tough, uh, people would uh, get to the base and surrender to the military. Um, I defended people who were uh, charged with murder and other kinds of things. And, uh, and the Uniform Code of Military Justice was really pretty decent <laughs> and still is, what I think. By so then they would be tried under the Code of Military right, Justice, right. not the state of Virginia. That's correct. Because That's they were correct. arrested on the post. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, after your military service, you went to Wausau. Then. Wausau, right. Okay, and what, what there? I uh, went to work. The, uh, the county had just agreed to expand the district attorney's office from one person to two. The second person would be an assistant district attorney and what we would call corporation counsel today. And uh, they knew that they needed somebody to do that because another interesting legal piece of uh, business, the U.S. Supreme Court in Baker versus Carr had said one person, one vote. Well, Marathon County is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. It's got all sorts of towns in it. Every town had a member on the county board, mm -hmm. and every city ward did. Huge uh, county board. Huge, <laughs> and a huge county board. And some of them represented 185 people. Some represented 2,000 people. So one of my first assignments was to try <laughs> to uh, persuade the county board to uh, comply with Baker versus Carr. And it meant a lot of folks were going to lose their seats, of course. A bunch of seats would be merged. It's, uh, and it happened. And, and they were, uh, the, the folks on the county board were really very understanding of it. But nonetheless, it was difficult. Everybody uh, had a seat. And uh, now uh, three quarters of them weren't going to have a seat. But uh, so you proposed the plan. They had to adopt it. Yes, right. They right. finally did, though. Yes, indeed. Yep. We have the same controversy going on now with the push to have some sort of independent commission to redistrict legislative yes. districts and congressional districts. Actually, in Wisconsin, I believe the last three times in a row, the courts ended up doing it, right? Yes. Well, when I was governor, uh, we did it by legislation. Uh, a very interesting story. Um, it happened. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, during the state budget, and Dave Travis uh, introduced an amendment to the budget. He called it a cardiographic, a minor cardiographic amendment or something. Dave Travis, Democrat of Madison. Right. It was a state redistricting plan. <sighs> And the amendment got adopted and the budget got adopted. Oh, the cartography plan. Yes. Yes, right. the, the cartography right. amendment. Yes. Just innocuous. So uh, I liked the plan, but I didn't think that was a way to do business. So I vetoed it, but I said I would call a special session so the legislature could come back and consider it as standing alone. Dave wasn't happy. Lynn Edelman wasn't happy. A lot of people weren't happy, but uh, they did, the legislature did, adopt essentially the Travis Amendment and that was the last time I think that the legislature did it. Yeah, since then it's gone gone to court. Yep. Well, you didn't hesitate to uh, make some of your fellow Democrats less than happy in that case and many others too. Well, if you uh, it, it doesn't seem like politicians do that anymore. Well, you know, I had a great relationship with the legislature though because I'd served uh, in the legislature and I made a point uh, of uh, having legislators out to the residents all the time. Sometimes one party, sometimes the other, most of the times mixed. Because at that time, people really did get along. They'd fight like the devil during the daytime, but in the evening, have a couple bottles of beer, usually at least a couple bottles of beer. <laughs> and people did get along. And so the, the legislature as an institution and the legislators individually, uh, tolerated me because I took them into, you know, I'd ask them, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? But I, uh, a lot of the things I did were fairly controversial. Mm -hmm. Do governors, have they, 
subsequent governors done that? Uh, I don't think to the same extent. Um, I th I'm sure some of it goes on. There are these almost institutional legislative dinners shortly after the session begins. They're very formal and not much fun. But the, the, the better ones are when you can uh, just come and kick your shoes off and uh, relax. And know one another's individuals. When I was in the legislature, it was a far more congenial place in part because the legislators knew one another as as people. They weren't, and and the and their political um, label was not a matter of first concern. You didn't judge somebody by his or her political label. I think that really went by the boards uh, a while ago. Although I like to think uh, comedy is coming back, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm encouraged to believe that that's the case. And I see people like. Jim Holprin, Peter Barca, now Tim Cullen, people who had served during the good old days, <laughs> uh, coming back to run again. And I don't think they'd come back if they thought it was going to be as bad as it was in the worst days uh, five, six years ago. Now you would, uh, uh, when you were in the legislature then, representing Wausau, your, uh, some of your colleagues you rode to Madison with, uh, Walter John Chilson. Right. And uh, the late Tiny Krieger. Yes, uh, Who correct. represented Merrill. Yeah. Uh, you'd carpool. Absolutely. Uh, tell, and I, I'm so s sorry the tiny Krieger is uh, gone. We'd yeah. love to have done him yeah. on here. What was that like? Oh, it was terrific. Uh, they both knew, particularly Walter John, because he knew me a little better, we were neighbors, uh, that I was a relative newcomer to the state. So they'd quiz me on state counties and their county seats, the whole business. Boy, I had that down pat. I <laughs> probably knew the counties and the county seats better than most of my colleagues. But they'd kid me and share their experiences with me. And, of course, Tiny's went way back to the progressive uh, movement. And he knew uh, that I was, at that time, um, uh, a votary of Gaylord Nelson. And he knew Gaylord uh, very well, of course. And he knew Pat. And, uh, pat Lucy. Oh, yeah. And uh, a wonderful, wonderful man, just as expansive and pleasant as could be. And he didn't give a darn, nor did Walter John, uh, what my political label was. Did you discuss politics, religion, oh, and everything? Uh, we'd discuss uh, legislation that was pending, some of the things that were going on. But it was never my trying to convert them or them trying to convert me. We'd talk about how it was going. Walter John and I belonged to the same church in Wausau. And uh, Walter John supported what was then called parochial aid, which was state aid to uh, religious schools. I was an opponent. And uh, Even though you both belong to the same, same church. church. And uh, <coughs> the pastor made it pretty clear which of the two of us he thought was uh, more worthy of being sent to Madison. And indeed, in one of the election campaigns the Sunday before the election, the pastor very explicitly suggested that uh, the parishioners vote for Walter John and not vote for Earl. Well, the Wausau Daily Record Herald wrote a story about it the next day and wrote an editorial saying they thought that this was inappropriate. And the, f the priest, Father Mannion at the time, went down to the newspaper. This became pretty famous. And he went in and he ranted and said, you can't do this. Who the hell do you think you are? And uh, he said, you can't tell me what to preach. And Win Freund, who was a reporter, said, I won't tell you what to preach, but you don't tell me what to print. <laughs> and they had, a, they had, a, had it out. But you were, you were not threatened with excommunication. I was not. This. I was not. Now there's a follow-up to that. Um, I got a fair amount of grief about it. And you, you were in Wausau for a while. I remember the Marathon County Fair, which comes in the fall before the election. It was one of the last big events that politicians would have an opportunity to press the flesh. <clears throat> so I was out there working the midway and this group of five or six people came up and they said, you're Representative Earl, aren't you? And I said, yes, I am. And they said, we just wanted to tell you uh, how impressed we are with your principled stand uh, against state aid to uh, parochial schools. And I said, well, gosh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I appreciate your taking the time to thank me. 
and I hope you'll remember me come November. And they said, oh, we're Jehovah's Witnesses. We don't vote. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, that was virtue as its own reward. Right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, currently, it's still a, a controversy. Some bishops have apparently ah. threatened members of Congress with excommunication oh, yes. for not towing the line on abortion, for example. That's correct. Uh, seems like even more extreme than it was at that time. Yeah, I think so. I think that uh, some in the uh, clergy now are far more comfortable intruding themselves into the political process to no good end. I don't think it helps them. I think it sets back uh, uh, what they ostensibly are, are, are pushing. And I think uh, not just because of the scandals that have gone on, but because of the more overt pushing into the public arena the hierarchy has lost a lot of traction uh, with, uh, with uh, the typical churchgoer. Are you still a churchgoer? No, I'm not. They drove me out. Mm -hmm. uh, my, all my family is, and I think that's good. I'm happy they are, but uh, the, uh, the pedophilia business, how it was denied, concealed, uh, uh, people were sent to other places where they'd have new opportunities to uh, commit crime. I thought it was terrible, and I, and I still do. And I think that the hierarchy has just been, uh, tone deaf is far too kind a description. And, uh, I, and I regret that. I brought up, I was educated in Catholic schools all the way through. Uh, my mother was a daily communicant. I, very strong religious background, but uh, maybe when I get a little bit older and I start to hedge my bets, I'll go back. <laughs> Do you, you haven't gone to any other church, though? No, no, no. Well, let's get back to politics. Anything okay. more about uh, <laughs> Marathon County District Attorney? Uh, well, I was there, uh, and I really enjoyed that job, but uh, after I'd been there about a year or so, the city of Wausau decided to hire a full-time city attorney. At that, up till then, they just would hire an attorney as they needed one. And uh, many of the folks who were on the Wausau Common Council were also on the Marathon County Board of Supervisors. And they came to see me and said, how would you like to be city attorney? We're going to create this position. And they were going to give me $1,000 a year raise. Yes. <laughs> and I thought, well, that sounds like an intriguing idea. So I did. But the interesting thing was I found out after I took the job, and I would have taken it anyway, that I was also, I was city attorney, I was attorney for the school board, the parks department, the water and sewer utility, the draft board, literally every public body saved the county board. But it was terrific. I learned, gosh, I learned all kinds of things having uh, the opportunity to do all these, uh, this variety of jobs. It, it, all over the map. Uh, yeah. this, was, this was some of the best training you could get? Absolutely. Um, I had opportunities to appear before the Supreme Court, the Public Service Commission because the water and sewer utility had to set rates and come down. I learned a heck of a lot about uh, state government being a local government official. Now, e even today, some young law school graduates would take this route, don't they? I mean, they oh, used sure. to uh, r yeah. run for district attorney or become an assistant district attorney. Yep. Figuring that's a good entry way to learn a lot of different things. It right? sure is. I, matter of fact, I am occasionally asked advice for, for young people who are going to school, and I say if you have any interest in public life and you've gone to law school, this is a great route to follow. Uh, you learn a heck of a lot in a short order, and you learn how to act on your feet and uh, deal with people, and if you're smart, uh, you learn not to be uh, ideological. <laughs> you, you learn that, uh, yeah, we all have feet of clay and uh, that the justice system functions best when it, is, when it functions as a human institution, not as a machine. Um, what did you argue before the state Supreme Court? Well, uh, we had a couple cases. Uh, one was when I was a city attorney, the city was landlocked and there were a lot more... Surrounded by suburbs, you mean. Yeah, or towns, they were, but they, they didn't want to become suburban, and they blocked efforts at annexation, and the city council was really stymied. Uh, well, uh, the city owned a large tract of land west of the city, out where the county home was. I don't know if you remember that, but the city owned... And 
reading the statutes, I read where the city, a city, could annex non-contiguous property if it was owned by the city. So quietly, without a lot of fanfare, I talked to some of the city council members, we annexed, the city annexed that piece of property. Well, the town of Statine in which it was located, they saw what was coming because then you try. it could go both ways and would, would join it. And uh, so they uh, sued and we ended up before the Supreme Court and uh, the city of Wausau was upheld. So you, you won that one? I won that one. <laughs> was right. that your only Supreme Court? I had one? another one. It was, a, a, you know, I don't remember all the details. But it was a case on tax abatements, uh, whether, you could, whether a city could or could not give uh, tax relief to get uh, uh, business in town. And um, what the city of Wausau did, I guess, was not regarded as a tax abatement. I don't remember all the details, but well, won that one too, but <laughs> had a couple, a couple of occasions. Anything other from your city attorney years? Uh, well, I, I'll tell you an interesting story about uh, that. I was, as I mentioned, attorney for the draft board. And uh, at that time... Uh, this, this was the height of the Vietnam War. Absolutely. Now. And I had friends uh, who taught at the uh, University of Wisconsin, Marathon County campus, who started a group called the Fellowship for Reconciliation. And they uh, counseled uh, young people who didn't want to get drafted. And uh, they came to see me and said, could I represent them and their point of view before the draft board? I said, oh, I, I don't you're, think so. You're already on the other side. Yeah. Uh, they said, well, why don't you ask them? So I did. I explained. I said I'd been asked by this group. And uh, they said, listen, we'd rather have these guys get some sensible legal advice before they come in here. Uh, we won't ask you what you told them, but yeah, go ahead. Let's try it. Yeah. So I did. And they were, they were very judicious. They knew who the fakers were, people who got religion, you know, uh, about two weeks before they got their draft notice, but people who'd been brought up in a religious family. And it worked out. Uh, that was a very interesting experience. So you thought the draft board was pretty understanding. I sure did, yeah. Even though you were kind of working both sides. <laughs> yeah, but, no, but they knew it. It was full yeah. transparency. and um, So I had a lot of very good experiences at that local level, that local government level. Well, shall we move to your run for the legislature? Sure. Why and how? Well, uh, among the other activities I got involved in, I got active with the Marathon County Democratic Party. Marathon County, like much of the state, had been a, a stronghold for the Republicans. But when David Obey uh, decided to run for the assembly against a 16-year incumbent, I guess, uh, he did the retail politics. He just surprised everybody. He won, and uh, in part because the Republicans just took it for granted that uh, they would win again. Dave immediately set out to build a Democratic Party in Marathon County. And part of that was uh, getting people who would take responsibility for wards, for passing out literature door to door, and uh, getting candidates for every spot. That was when the coroner, the surveyor, I think they probably, maybe they still are elected, but there was a, a lot, there were a lot of candidates. And uh, I got very deeply involved in that. I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed the politics a great deal. And uh, time passed, and in, uh, when Richard Nixon was elected president, he uh, named Melvin Laird Secretary of Defense. Melvin Laird had represented the 7th Congressional District since Adam was a pup mm -hmm. and was a very strong uh, candidate and would have been elected as long as he was there, but it suddenly opened this up. And Dave Obey, once again, seeing an opportunity, announced for it. And uh, again, he wasn't given a lot of chance, but he worked like crazy. He ran, as a matter of fact, against Walter John Chilson, uh, who was the state senator from the district. Dave won uh, 800 votes or so. Huge upset, big thing, and we were celebrating uh, Dave's win, 15, 20 of us, and Dave being uh, 
the consummate politician he is, said, well, I, I'm leaving in the morning. I'm heading out to Washington, but we don't break up until we get a candidate for my assembly seat. Warren Knowles is bound to call an election. The election was in April. The he was the governor at the time. Yeah, Warren Knowles was governor. And the congressional election, the special, was in April. He said, Warren Knowles is bound to call a special election. We've got to get a candidate. Uh, and, uh, well, who do you think ought to run, Dave? And Dave said, I think Earl ought to run. Oh, I was, I, I really didn't think I would have a chance. I'd only lived in town for five years, maybe, or so. I said, oh, gosh, Dave. He said, listen, uh, you got politics in your blood. If you don't do this, you'll kick yourself in the backside from now till kingdom come. Do it. Make a long story short, I ran. And uh, uh, and I won in a special election, and uh, I came down here, and Dave was right. I really did enjoy it here. I it was I was in the minority at first. the the uh, The assembly was very closely divided, and uh, I was in the minority. Uh, Harold Freilich was the speaker. You recall Harold. Paul Alfonsi was the majority leader. Bob Huber was the minority leader. Uh, in because Dave had been in the leadership. Um, they didn't rewire the whole thing for the, the board, the voting board. So they said, why don't you just sit up in OBC? Well, I was immediately <laughs> up with the leader. Sitting in the front? <laughs> That's right. And it was terrific. I could see all that was going on. And uh, it was a great, great learning experience just being where I was rather than literally being out on the back benches. And that was absolutely fortuitous. Well, you became majority leader in your second term, right? Yeah, I yes. Mean, that, that's, I think, unprecedented. That's extremely I, unusual. Yeah, well, well, it was, again, another set of fortuitous circumstances. The Democrats won the uh, majority in the assembly the next election cycle. That would be the 70 election. Mm -hmm, that is correct. And Bob Huber then became the speaker, and uh, Bob decided... Uh, we're going to really go at this. We're not going to just name people to important committees based on seniority. So I put people like Dennis Conta, Tony Earle, on joint finance, or as people always say, the all-powerful <laughs> joint finance. Even committee. then it was. Yeah, even, oh, especially then, I think. And uh, so I got on joint finance, and uh, not surprisingly, uh, with the... Uh, Senate Republican, the Assembly Democratic, the budget went to conference. And Bob named me one of the three conferees. And uh, so again, I was getting a lot of attention and getting to know all the members really well because I knew what everybody wanted, what they didn't want. And the budget passed. As soon as the budget passed, uh, Bob retired. Pat Lucy named him Highway Commissioner. That's what Bob wanted to do anyway. And so now we had an election for Speaker, and Norm Anderson ran for Speaker. That opened up his spot. He'd been the majority leader. I ran for majority leader. And, That's uh, mighty fast promotion. Oh, yeah. Well, it, uh, as, as you know, we talk about this, and I, I, I don't want any false modesty, uh, but so many of these things were absolutely serendipitous. Uh, there's no way in the world I could have uh, planned it out or whatever. And uh, that's another life lesson. When you see an opportunity, you better grab it uh, because you can't manufacture an opportunity and it may not come back again. And I had that, that very good luck. And I enjoyed being majority leader a lot. I worked very closely with John Shabazz, my opposite number on the other side. And uh, we would <clears throat> go at it pretty good, but we, uh, we got along. And one of the great, great experiences I had as a, as a human being was when I got down to the legislature, I really learned, I, I guess I knew it, but I learned it viscerally, uh, tolerance, understanding the other fellow's point of view, uh, that what a person believes in or, or what a person may articulate doesn't reflect any fatal flaw of character. 
At that time, the Capital Times notwithstanding, they thought that anybody who stood for election was exposing a fatal flaw of character. I mean, it was, <laughs> but uh, I, I realized that 90% of the folks with whom I served uh, had the best of motivations for running. They really wanted to see better schools, better highways, a cleaner environment. They had very different notions about how to get there, uh, but they really wanted to see, to get things done, to do a better job. And I really uh, learned that. I thought it was a wonderful life lesson. And uh, it helped in, in uh, working with people, getting along with people. I think people understood that, although I, was, I could be as partisan as anybody, and I was on occasion. Uh, it didn't carry into personal relationships. You mentioned John Shabazz, who was noted, uh, we've, done, we've done an oral history yeah. with him, for being somewhat irascible uh, and uh, absolutely uh, opposite from you in absolutely. politics, but you still stay in touch. Oh yes, we still see one another from time to time, yeah. Yes, John, uh, well you covered the legislature for a while, and see the leg legislature in action. I would get up and make what I thought would be a very persuasive speech about something, and John would get up and he'd say, swell. Mm -hmm. That was his all-purpose put-down, <laughs> swell. <laughs> and. Uh, but we, uh, we got along then and we get along still. There are a group of us who served back then in the 60s and 70s, Democrats and Republicans. We get together about once every other month and uh, break bread, have a couple libations, and John shows up all the time. We are inspired, of course, by the knowledge that those were indeed the good old days. All the sunsets were golden, <laughs> the winters were short. The Badgers had winning seasons. But seriously, uh, they were better times. Uh, I, I don't have any doubt about that. And folks like Dale Catnon and Bob Lang, who were in the Fiscal Bureau, they, we invite them to come on occasion, bring us up to date what's happening. And they will say that it was, a, it was a better time then. And it was a better time because people did get along and got to know one another. There wasn't any of this business like if you fraternize with somebody from the other side, you're out of here. I, I can't believe that uh, it, it uh, fell to that level. I think it's coming back. I think it's getting a little better. Uh, let me, before we go any further, you were kind of mentored by Gaylord Nelson? Well, shortly after getting to Marathon County, uh, again, Dave Obey said, well, there's going to be a big election, 68, and uh, you ought to meet Gaylord Nelson. He's going to be up. And uh, he needs a campaign manager in this area. And I said, gosh, I hardly know. Well, here's a way to learn the area. So it ended up I had Marathon, Portage, and Wood as the counties. So I, it's a huge geographic. It is. Area. It is a huge. Did you ever end up at home? Uh, <laughs> but anyhow, I saw, I saw a lot of Gaylord. And I knew of him, and I, I knew of his uh, work on the environment. and. Uh, Gosh, I got to, the more I got to know him, the more I admired him, and he was great fun. And, uh, great storyteller. Great storyteller. I wish we could get him in this seat. He'll oh, seat too. yes, indeed. And I would go around with uh, Gaylord, and uh, speaking of great storytellers, the late Harvey Duholm from Polk and Burnett. And whenever we'd get over in that side of the state, Gaylord was great pals with both uh, Fritz Mondale and Hubert Humphrey. So I got exposed to Fritz and uh, Hubert, and uh, God, just sitting there, hearing these guys banty banter about the whole business, it was just terrific. Uh, they were, uh, gosh, I take a look at the U.S. Senate now, and you wonder where are the people of that stature, but hmm, I don't see them there now. So how did you run for office the first time? 69, you're running for special election. Right, and I did what was the- campaigning like? I did the retail politics, and one of the things that really made the retail politics work for me, I think. That's door to door. Door to door, right. right door to door. Began every day with a plant gate. Uh, ended every day with a plant gate. Those plants that there are paper mills up there, and they would go three shifts. Uh, pick out a ward, go door to door. But it was before uh, radio and television were that significant in uh, campaigns, it, which is fine if they were no more significant now, I'd be happy. But anyway, uh, the candidate that 
did the retail politics had a leg up in a sense because the other party, they didn't do that kind of thing. I don't know why, but they didn't. So anyhow, that's how I happened to, I happened to win. As a matter of fact, we're just telling stories. Uh, you shouldn't get me going. I uh, was elected. I got a call from Bob Zimmerman, the Secretary of State, uh, that night. Congratulations, he said. Uh, I'm going to certify you as a winner today so you can come down and get sworn in tomorrow if you want. Why don't you come on down? Zimmerman was a very gregarious guy. A Republican. Yeah. But, oh, yeah. but talk about retail politics. He was one of the, you bet. I doubt if he ever spent a dollar on his elections. Of course, his father had been governor long before, so he had the name. Yeah, he had the name. But anyway, he yeah. was, Secretary. if you walked into his office, you were likely to meet him. You know, Absolutely. Not have to go through a secretary or something. There he Absolutely, was. that's right. So he invited me to come down. So, gosh, I got out my, I had one suit at the time, two suits maybe. Got in the car and headed out early to come down here and help save the world. Well, Father Droppy had taken over the assembly chambers just a couple of days before, and <laughs> the National Guard uh, was at all, at all the doors, and I showed up and wouldn't let you in. Wouldn't let me in. And uh, I'm trying to persuade him that I, I uh, gee, I belong here. And I understand why they wouldn't let me in. They didn't know me from Adams off Ox. And along came Bob Huber, as a matter of fact. Fortunately, he was going in the same door I was. And he said, I can vouch for this guy. Let him in. So <laughs> they let me in. Harold Freilich swore me in. And... Uh, Yes. By this time, was the assembly chamber available? It was available, okay. right. They've Father Grappi had uh, had uh, left, had been, but the, but the ramifications of that were still going on because there were all sorts of resolutions to condemn Grappi, and and you may recall there was even an effort using some arcane legislative process to have the legislature arrest him. Mm. Uh, I forget what it was. And so that was a quite a battle royal. It didn't happen. Um, but uh, it poisoned the atmosphere for a while. Um, but everybody got over it. Now, this was 70 then would have been with that election when the Democrats took over right. after more than 30 years of Republicans. Right. That must have been a heck of a change. In the oh, <laughs> not only did... Democrats take over, but they took over with a huge majority. I mean, everybody was stunned. And there were Democrats elected who for years had run as sort of sacrificial lambs in their district. Now, this is 70. Yeah. This is before Watergate really yeah. took effect. Yes. Why, why did the Democrats have such a huge... Well, I think part of it was uh, the Republicans were at war with one another. The John Shabazzes and Kenny Merkels and Russ Olsons of the world really were uh, after Warren Knowles. Boy, oh boy, they didn't have any time for Warren Knowles, and uh, the and uh, the Republican candidate was Jack Olson for governor. Pat Lucy had run a couple times, and it just seemed that the wind was in the Democrats' sails. And the Republicans, a lot of the Republicans, were sort of dispirited by the internal fight that they'd had. Um, and I have to tell you, I no one. Uh, saw it coming. No, I, I thought we would win the majority. I think most of the Democrats thought we'd win the majority because we were only one or two seats away. But nobody saw it swing up into the 60-some votes. And uh, it, was, it was quite a change. Was the uh, complaint that Knowles was too moderate? Yes. Oh, yeah. Warren Knowles, Odie Fish, uh, Former, Jim uh, Morgan. Yeah, Odie, uh, Odie Fish was the uh, state Republican chair. Right. And they were all seen as too moderate. We and still seem to be, the Republican Party is still seeming to be doing that today. Yeah, it is. Although it was different then, it was a, the uh, conservatism at that time was uh, not based on um, social, issues. social issues. No, which is, which is what characterizes many of the conservatives today. It was really uh, philosophical. John Shabazz and Kenny Merkel and those folks really thought that the entitlement programs had gone too far. They were against AFDC, even though it's a federal plan, but a uh, federal law. But anything like those entitlement programs, they thought had gone too far. And uh, it, was a, it was a fight that's 
goes on in the Republican Party to this day. You know, when uh, Dwight Eisenhower was elected, I think he accepted what had come before and didn't try to change it. But ever since him, beginning with Ronald Reagan and then clearly with the second President Bush, the notion was to turn back the clock. It, you know, you could, you could get rid of it, even explicitly say, well, get rid of Social Security. Uh, it was that kind of a, uh, an attitude, I think, to a lesser extent. John Shabazz, as you may recall, was appointed by Ronald Reagan. No, uh, no bench. big surprise there. Yeah, to the bench ult ultimately, and uh, I'm sure John still thinks that the entitlement programs have run amok <laughs> the whole business. Well, now during your term as majority leader, uh, the state that made a couple of really big decisions: university merger, uh, for one. Yes. Uh, you were obviously had to be involved in that. Yes, there, there are folks I know at the University of Wisconsin-Madison who remind me of that from time to time. <laughs> Don't like it. Don't like it. Uh, Esther Kaplan, who had been Gaylord Nelson's secretary, reminds me every once in a while, I've seen Esther, she's in advanced years now, that she doesn't understand how a young man, she flatters me, apparently as intelligent is I could have supported merger. The University of Wisconsin will never be the same if you can put Platteville on the diploma. Mm -hmm. I thought then, and I think now it was a terrible elitist kind of notion, but boy, people felt strongly about it. And the thing that, that another thing impressed me, uh, the Republican Party, for whatever reason at that time, took a position against merger, in part because it was Pat Lucy's proposal, I think, and uh, there was a general notion that it was such a radical idea, such a radical departure, it wouldn't have a prayer. Well, I knew on the Democratic side, uh, I would go over to the Republican side, and I knew Ray Johnson, Republican of Eau Claire. U.W. Eau Claire. Right. Mm -hmm. And you'd see all these folks who represented the uh, WSU campuses uh, they all wanted to see an upgrade for their institutions, and they didn't care if it was Pat Lucy's idea or not. <laughs> and it won pretty comfortably, as it turned out, although going, th going, going uh, through it, it looked like it would have a very tough time. From the financial and efficiency point of view, would you say it was inevitable, the merger? Or well, I mean, maybe not then, but something... Yeah, I had mentioned I was on joint finance. Everybody in the legislature, Democrat or Republican, understood that the system that existed pre-merger couldn't be sustained. Uh, the WSU advocates with state, state, universities. state universities would expand somewhere. And then... All, the, yeah, both systems were expanding willy-nilly. And then Wisconsin would say, we'll see yours and double it. So the legislature created the coordinating committee council. and higher coordinating council on higher education don percy ran it and they were supposed to sit in judgment on these things and stop this well uh they would give one to the wsu system and one to <laughs> madison i mean they didn't stop it at all and it was getting to the point where well we had a campus in medford uh, the only one that's ever been closed, I believe. That's correct. That's correct. <laughs> but yeah, Platteville established a center at Richland Center. Richland Center. The, the UW system at Parkside and Green Bay and everybody and, was... Oh, and you go up the eastern side of the state and there's Parkside, Whitewater, UW-Milwaukee, Waukesha, uh, Washington County, uh, Sheboygan, Manitowoc, uh, center system. Yeah, campuses. and uh, Oshkosh, Green Bay. Seems like almost every legislator has one. Well, that was <laughs> which has been to the university's advantage. That was what was, that was what was happening, and uh, it didn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, the notion was the university should be accessible to anyone in the state, and when the WSU system and Madison first started this business, it was so. Everybody would be, nobody would be more in a day's drive. Well, uh, that's surely quaint now. Um, and it did get to be overdone. One of the things 
a modest disappointment I have with merger. I think in the main it's been a very good idea. One of the things that was supposed to come out of merger, and Pat Lucy really pushed it, was that not every campus would try to be a miniature Madison. Madison would have the professional schools and the graduate schools, but the other campuses ought to try to develop uh, specialties. Stout has done that. Stevens Point has done that, natural resources. But a lot of them still aspire to be a little Madison. And it's too bad because if there were more of the specialization, uh, they, schools could be even, even stronger, even better. The other thing, another thing that uh, the Lucy administration was known for was the machinery and equipment exemption for yes. manufacturers, which relieved manufacturers of a big property tax sure did. load on their machinery and equipment. Now that was hard fought yes. uh, at the time. Uh, tell us about that. Well, that's one of those uh, ideas that proves the truth. Uh, success has a thousand fathers, failure is an orphan. Uh, after M&E passed, well, it was Pat Lucy's idea, it was Dennis Conta's idea, it was Bob Huber's idea, everybody. Uh, in my uh, judgment, the idea really came from Dennis Conta. He was the first one ever talked to me about it. We were on joint finance. And uh, we knew that Walter Hollander wanted to get rid of the personal property tax. Now, he was a Republican, longtime Republican, and he was the former Republican chair of right, the committee. Right, right. A grand person, a giant, just a wonderful person. We knew he wanted to get rid of that, and uh, as I say, we're Democrats and Republicans each made up half the committee. And Dennis suggested in conversation we had, well, we ought to propose something, and the personal property tax was a nuisance, but uh, manufacturing machinery and equipment, if you could make that tax exempt, that would be a real job creator. And he brought it up with me, well, we were good friends, but he brought it up with me in part because the district I represented had paper mills and a part of, you know, they have, all it is is uh, equipment and electricity and electricity. Extremely expensive equipment, yeah, those giant yeah. paper making machines. But uh, uh, we, Push that idea, and, and Pat Lucy was for it. He, I don't, I don't think any of those of us who were involved in the discussions early on had any idea how significant it would turn out to be, and uh, that passed then. Um, and Walter Hollander was glad it was a package of tax cuts: the personal property tax and the manufacturing machinery and equipment tax uh, cut, and. Uh, Everybody was happy except uh, the municipalities in which the factories were located because they lost that property tax. Property tax. All property. they had to tax was the shed that was over the machines. And uh, that was always very valuable. <laughs> well, the state has uh, supposedly been offsetting property taxes. I mean, I'll ask you about it now. We have to get at it sometime. Yeah. The original state income tax in, I believe, 1912 the explicit reason for it was to relieve property taxes, yeah. and the debate has continued ever since. Uh, <laughs> give us a quick summary. <laughs> we, uh, I, uh, I often think it is a shame that when you have times of fiscal difficulty, as our state does and many do now, people don't take it as an opportunity to redo the tax system. And the property tax uh, was meant to support those uh, features of government which related to the ownership of property. Police protection, fire protection, water, sewer, trash pickup. But uh, it wasn't meant to uh, run the courts, for example. Uh, that's and a schools. state function. School, School's the well, biggest uh, user yeah, of property tax. Money. Absolutely. And that doesn't bear any relationship to the owner, ownership of property. Um, but everybody is so invested in at least a part of the status quo that uh, nobody wants to go back and, and change it. And uh, I think you can't change it incrementally. I think you'd have to redo the tax system. For example, the sales tax was conceived of and adopted when we were a goods economy. We're a services economy now. We don't tax services dog grooming and a couple of meaningless things. 
Plus, the, a lot of the goods are now sold from out of state. Sure. So the, it's sure. out of the state's reach Absolutely. for practical purposes. Absolutely. And it, um, so anyhow, the whole tax structure could, uh, could stand a great revision, that's for sure. Anything else stand out from your time at the majority leader? Uh, no, I, well, we did, we did a, some other things. You had mentioned merger and uh, the M&E, sure but we did, uh, we changed the formula by which shared revenues go back to municipalities. They used to go back on the basis of origin so that River Hills would get a big dollop of shared revenues back and uh, Ashland County would get very, very little. So Governor Lucy's proposal was a local tax effort and uh, the uh, income in local areas be taken into account and that the tax sharing be used to try to close the gap between the haves and the have-nots. Equalization. Nots. Equalization, that's right. And that was a very controversial uh, issue. Uh, smacks of what you hear nowadays, a socialist idea, mm -hmm. you know. So spread the wealth or that's even right. it out. Exactly but right. it passed. It's it, a, it passed. Not a complete leveling. No, but a, but a great deal of it passed. Some of the things that uh, were suggested at that time in the leveling, under the leveling rubric, included negative aids, you may recall that, so that very wealthy school districts would kick money into the pot rather than mm. take money out of the pot. Well, <laughs> that really set a fire under some folks. Now, later on, as, as I understand it now, there is a fail-safe for the wealthy districts. They cannot go be below a certain I don't know. It could level. be, yeah. Uh, and they certainly can't go into negative. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be politically difficult. Eh? Well, it was... Uh, uh, it was tried, to, and it had some traction, but it didn't have enough traction to make it. Well, then what happened to you after that? After 75, uh, we, we haven't gotten to your cabinet uh, positions yet, a DNR secretary and DOA secretary. Well, uh, I, I loved it in the legislature. It was a great thing to do. But I didn't see it as a career. And uh, so I decided to leave the legislature, and it didn't take much persuasion, but some friends of mine talked me into running for attorney general as I was on my way out. Bob Warren was the attorney general at the time. Well, I wasn't the only one who had the idea. Ed Nager did, Tom Jacobson did, and ultimately Bronson LaFollette did. So I ran for attorney general, and I was given a uh, lesson on how significant the La Follette name was in uh, Wisconsin politics, I was knocked out. And uh, I went back to Wausau to practice law. I thought, well, I'd had my kick at the cat, and I really did enjoy it. Uh, and uh, come December or so, uh, Governor Lucy called me. And he said, uh, geez, I have a favor. What's that? He said, I just learned today that Joe Nussbaum, Secretary of the Department of Administration, is going to leave, and he's going to leave right after the end of the year. I've got to introduce a budget. No, I'm not going to have a Secretary of Administration. You've got to come down here, and I'd like you to do this. I thought, oh, Governor, I'm really flattered. Thank you very much. But I was not particularly interested. So I said, Thank, well, thanks very much. Well, I got a call from Gaylord Nelson. He said, geez, I understand that. Uh, Pat Lucy is interested in you being secretary of DOA, and you turned him down. Don't be crazy. Then David Carley called, another friend. And then David Obi called. I was getting lobbied by all these people. This is a great job. You'll like it. You'll do well in it. They'll make a long story short. I did. I came down here, uh, secretary of Department of Administration, although I, I had told the governor at the time, if I ever have an opportunity to go to DNR, that's where I'd like to go. I really, the agency had been merged nominally between the traditional conservation functions, parks, forestry, fish you know, conservation, and, right, and some environmental protection functions. But it was still the old conservation department. They, the, the uh, environmental protection functions were given awfully short shrift. 
And uh, I was really ambitious to try to change that. I'd try to do it in a legislature. And he said, oh yeah, but you know, if it ever comes along, we'll talk about it at the time. Uh, so I did Department of Administration. Uh, uh, he asked me to see if I could, uh, as putting the budget together and off, I could get rid of a couple of the two-year campuses. As you mentioned, we got rid of one. <laughs> the smallest one. <laughs> right, the smallest one. We almost, we had uh, Richland Center on the ropes, but Joanne Duran was more tenacious than... Uh, a Democrat representing the area right, at the right. time. <laughs> so uh, I, I enjoyed the service at DOA, but I'd been there about a year or so, and by this time, uh, the DNR board had all changed over. They were all uh, Pat Lucy appointees, and I knew all of them. I knew each of them, and they knew of my interest in uh, elevating the environmental protection side of the agency. So uh, one day, r right out of the blue, they called me and... Uh, the DNR board did. The DNR board. And they said, uh, uh, we've decided we're going to retire Lester Voigt, and we want to know if you're interested in doing this because we could save a search. We don't need to do a national search if you'd be interested, et cetera. Well, I said I'd have to talk to the governor I, because I told him. So I went to see Pat Lucy, and he said, I don't know why you'd want to do this. He said, this a DNR is just, just awful. Uh, but he said, I'll give you a piece of advice. He said, uh, if you can get uh, two-thirds or more of them to support you, fine. But uh, don't do it on a very close vote. Don't do it because it's a too controversial an age. So I knew then, I mean, these folks had talked to me. I knew it would be almost everybody. And it was. There was one abstention. Bud Jordahl abstained because he was interested in it. So anyhow, I got named Secretary of Department of uh, Natural Resources. And that was a great job, too. It was wonderful. God, I, uh, uh, and uh, the DNR at that time was really held in low repute. DNR, damn near Russia. DNR, support it with a rope, all this other business. And uh, I decided the very first thing I had to do was to try to change the notion that it was uh, an isolated uh, agency. I had to use the popular parts of the agency, parks, fish, and wildlife, to try to push for other things. And I would go out uh, at least two, three nights a week. DNR had, a, had an Air Force at the time, those little push poles. And I'd go to every damn rod and gun club I could get to. And uh, I had a regular mantra, I'd say, I, I know that you guys here at the Nina Rod and Gun Club are really anxious that we expand our fish hatcheries, but you know, we're here in Nina, the Fox Valley. What good does it do if we put the fish out here in the Fox River? They, can't, they won't carry over, they can't be sustained. We gotta do something about the damn paper mills, dumping all the stuff in the river. And I could see, you know, there'd be some nodding. Make a long story short, the uh, the rod and gun guys really, all of them hunted, not all of them, most of them hunted and fished. And they got behind this whole thing. And we really did uh, elevate the, uh, the uh, visibility of the environmental stuff. And I started my lifelong love affair with Henry Meyer when I had been there about two or three months. We sued the city of Milwaukee. Uh, for Henry polluting. Meyer was the mayor. Henry Meyer was the mayor. We sued the city of Milwaukee and we sued Scott Paper in Oconto Falls. I, I remember I was full of myself, I must say. said that the DNR up to this point had gone after cheese factories and little villages, but we were going to go after the two biggest surface water polluters in the state. One private, one public. Scott Paper, city of Milwaukee. And we sought an injunction against Milwaukee. No expansion of sewers until you and treat what you're already collecting. Well, so, so once again, you're riling up a fellow Democrat. Yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this incident uh, explains in large part why I'm so strongly in favor of a citizen board 
for Department of Natural Resources, an issue that comes back and forth. So Governor Lucy called. He said, uh, can you come down to the office? Uh, Henry Meyer's on his way in, and he's just madder than a hatter. And I said, well, sure, of course I would be there. Well, Henry was in one of his moods. He fired his tobacco pouch across the room. And he said, Pat, you got to rein this young whippersnapper in. He's going to destroy the city of Milwaukee. Who the hell does he think he is, et cetera? And uh, Pat Lucy sat there and said, gee, Henry, he said, I, I can understand your distress about all this. But he said, I can't fire him. He said, he's uh, been hired by this citizen board. And Pat was in favor of cabinet form of government. Yes, he'd, he'd lost, in fact, trying to get this earlier. That's right, that's right. <laughs> but he knew what we were doing was the right thing. I think he also understood that uh, he couldn't have let it stand if he did have the power to fire me. Uh, but we did. We went after the city of Milwaukee, and we won that one. We went after Scott Paper, won that one. And it just built a mo huge momentum for change on cleaning up the environment. Um, the judge, I think it was Myron Gordon, I don't know for sure, said in the Scott Paper case to the attorneys, he said, you gentlemen ought to consider yourselves fortunate that the state didn't choose to bring a criminal action because if they had, I would have your CEO in jail. Because they were willfully just uh, saying to hell with it. Just uh, dumping uh, anything. Yeah, in. yeah. And uh, boy, did it change. I was invited to the dedication of more wastewater treatment plants. After that, everybody was building a wastewater treatment plant. They got the word, and uh, so it was an exciting time to be at DNR. It was a great, great time. Now, was that about the time the legislature required cities to have sewage treatment? Yes, treatments? that's right. We did that. Um, that was and, by legislation. Right. Yeah. And uh, what was very fortuitous at the time Gaylord Nelson, Ed Muskie, and others were in the Congress, and uh, they passed the Clean Water Act, which made a huge amount of public dollars available for building sewage treatment plants, the whole infrastructure, the whole works. <clears throat> and But you had to be, quote, shovel ready or whatever. Well, we really got ready in a hurry, and, and uh, Wisconsin moved faster than almost any state in getting sewage treatment plants uh, up and going. Now, there are a lot of problems with our water quality even today, but compared to what it was like back then when the Carhuga River caught fire and and uh, dead fish were piling up on the beaches of Lake Michigan and all of that, boy, it's a it's a remarkably better uh, circumstance than it was than it was uh, 30, 40 years ago. Have you already, always been interested in the environment? I w yes, I, I really have. Well. Growing up in the Upper Peninsula, it's magnificent country. There aren't enough people up there to screw it up. Uh, but uh, I always thought, until I became a young adult, that of course when you were uh, on a water body, you could see to the bottom. And uh, I didn't realize there are places you couldn't. That's right. right. I didn't re when I got to Wausau, I couldn't get over it. Uh, the mills were a lot of paper mills, uh, just dumping the stuff in. And of course, the air was a problem too. And I, gee, I remember mentioning, geez, it smells awful here in Mosley. Smells like money to us, son. <laughs> you know, okay, <laughs> but people learned to live with it. Yeah, belching it, smokestacks were a sign of prosperity. Absolutely, absolutely. So it was a, a time of great change, great ferment, and uh, it was a wonderful time to be there. Are you still a hunter? Oh, I go, I'm no threat to the uh, deer population, <laughs> but yeah, I go out every fall, and uh, I really enjoy it. I enjoy the camaraderie, getting together with the, the fellows in the camp. I enjoy getting out in the woods alone. I go way up, uh, uh, very near the Michigan line, as a matter of fact. There aren't a heck of a lot of deer, but there aren't very many hunters either, so you don't, it isn't like being out in a, in a shooting gallery like parts of uh, southern Wisconsin are. <laughs> We've turned southern Wisconsin into a deer paradise. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it, you didn't have at that time the controversy over how many deer are there in the state, or did oh, you? Oh, yes, we did. <laughs> so that, oh. That's been going forever. Uh, we never had enough. And uh, then they were far more powerful than they are now. The Conservation Congress uh, would take the DNR to task. And uh, 
the Congress thought there weren't enough beer on, deer, pardon me, unless every member got one. Of course, uh, if you've ever been in a hunting camp, a good part of the hunting camp is spent in the camp. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there are people who really do go out to hunt. But uh, we would have all the figures. That's why we do the deer registration. And of course, the real critics in the Congress would say, no, you phony those numbers up. There weren't that many deer killed. People are still saying that. Oh, people yeah. won't believe the DNR today. No. And so now they're starting a huge new count. Yeah. They're trying to. And they're having the man in the street. <laughs> I mean, how can you say we are short of deer when you can't drive <coughs> from here to Fond du Lac without seeing three or four deer dead along the side of the road? From here to Milwaukee, for the love of Pete. Very busy highway. Uh, and you would think that in these urban areas, there w those urban areas, uh, there wouldn't be so many deer, but the deer is a very adaptable critter, and uh, I think we got more than enough of them. Well, there's uh, the hunters, there's never enough deer, but you ask a suburban homeowner or a farmer, <laughs> there's too many deer, exterminate yeah. them. Yeah. You can't satisfy everybody. Yeah, that's for sure. That's well, for let's sure. move on to the governorship. Then uh, you ran, you went from being secretary of the DNR to running for governor. Well, I most people would not say that's a good platform. For most yes, to run yeah. for well, a lot of people did say that, John. No, what happened? Once again, I thought, you know, this has been a wonderful ride. But I, I, I resigned my position, and I went to work for a law firm. I thought I got to get my legal credentials up and going again. And in uh, 1981 or so. Uh, I always had, I've always had an interest in politics. I'd get together, friends of mine, and they'd say, gee, who's going to run against Lee Dreyfus? Nobody thought anybody was. He was very popular, wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, no, nobody's going to run. Well, people said, geez, Earl, you got one more kick at the cat. Why don't you? Uh, no, I don't know. <clears throat> Make a long story short, uh, January, February of 82, uh, I decided I would do it. I thought, let's try it. In part, uh, only modestly in part, uh, as you may recall, Lee ran against the DNR. Uh, he was going to move the headquarters to Medford, and uh, he, he was one of the, the three f most frequently told lies, the third of which was, I'm from the DNR, and I'm here to help you. <laughs> but he came up with this notion um, that Wisconsin ought to consider selling uh, Great Lakes water. Already the clamor was coming from the southwest. And I said, that's a terrible idea. I was out of pot, but I said, yeah, it's a I think I wrote an op-ed or something. Oh, he said, come on, Earl, you're really off track. We could become the blue-eyed Arabs of North yeah, America. the OPEC of water. Right, that's right. And, well, I thought, Gee whiz, that was one of the things that really gave me a modest nudge. So I decided to run for governor. Nobody else would touch it. Everybody thought that uh, Lee Dreyfus was uh, unbeatable, and I thought it would take a lightning strike to beat him. I was up in Green Bay April or May of that year, and boy, I, you'd do anything to get on radio or television if you were an unknown candidate. And I went into WBAY to do an interview about the noon hour, and the guy who was going to interview me said, well, what do you make of the news from Madison? I said, what's that? He said, well, haven't heard? No. Lee Dreyfus announced today he is not going to seek re-election. Honest to God, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Holy cow. I was absolutely dumbfounded. Well, that put the race in a whole new uh, light, and uh, very quickly a couple more people got into the race. And uh, it was a lively, spirited race. And uh, one of the great experiences of that campaign was that uh, Lee Dreyfus, always being unpredictable, uh, at his last Republican convention, it was in Milwaukee, uh, suggested that the, uh, the Democrat and Republican candidates for governor debate. Well, I accepted with alacrity. Terry Kohler said, not on your life, but Lowell Jackson said yes. 
And uh, the moderator was... Well, was Lowell had been uh, Lee Dreyfus' campaign right, manager. Was right. he working for Terry Kohler? Or? No, no, no. He, was, he decided to run himself. Oh, okay. Lowell ran. And uh, so it was Lowell Jackson and uh, Tony Earl. Bill Krauss was the moderator. And he of course, also been a Dreyfus campaign sure. manager. Sure, <laughs> and of course the people running the convention didn't like this idea at all. But the media showed up. The media thought it was great. Of course, Lee Dreyfus was there in the front row. It was his idea. He thought this would be great stuff, and it was wonderful. We got such attention, and it was a good debate. Uh, we took remarkably different positions on darn near everything, and uh, it was so much fun that um and so so good we got invited to do it other places lowell jackson tony earl and we went out on the circuit he would fly lowell flew an airplane so i'd have to pay plane. him yeah. yep. so we went to green bay wausau lacrosse eau claire finally the television stations got wise to this they said if you guys want to continue to do this you're gonna to have to pay for the time <laughs> we were getting all this free it was wonderful stuff it was good it was good, and it didn't ever get trite. We didn't repeat the same script or whatever. And it's a replay of 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 seventy uh, eight, uh, when Dreyfus debated Carly. Right. There were uh, Bob Caston was the the uh, establishment Republican candidate, and uh, uh, Marty Schreiber, the uh, acting governor. Right. And they wouldn't debate. No. So Dreyfus told got together with David Carly the outsider Democratic candidate yeah, and yeah. said, we'll debate, the two of us. And they did all over the state. Yeah, two colorful live. I, I think that's where Lee thought the thing would be good, would be good to do that thing again in 82. And it worked for him in 78. Yeah, it sure <laughs> did. It sure did. I remember I knew each of them well. Um, and I remember they said the one thing that we uh, uh, used to argue about was... Uh, who would win the governorship and who would continue this road show? Because they, uh, <laughs> they really enjoyed it. Well, I, I can remember that morning uh, at the state capitol, a group of reporters asked Tommy Thompson, when they, who was then minority leader of the assembly, when the news came out that Dreyfus yeah. wasn't running and this was already April. Yeah. Well, uh, Tommy knew, of course, instantly that the Republicans were now starting too late. Yeah. And I've never seen him matter. Is he right? was just livid <laughs> because he knew what the implication was for the yeah. governor campaign, yeah. which Dreyfus apparently you know, didn't care that much. Well, about. you know, God bless Lee Dreyfus. It, you know, he didn't feel in his gut he wanted to do it again. He wasn't going to let these other constraints uh, dictate what he did or didn't do. Now, do you think it was because the economy was tanking, though? I don't know. I, because uh, he, he, <laughs> he came in with a $2 billion deficit, gave a billion back to the taxpayers, left with a billion dollar deficit, right. which the very first, your very first legislature and the very first bill you signed yeah. was a billion dollar tax increase, oh, yes. making the 5% sales tax permanent. Yes. So th that was a good time for him to leave, I think. <laughs> well, part of it, you know, I think that w may have been part of it, but part of it was Joyce clearly did not like his it. wife. She yeah. didn't enjoy it at all. Lee enjoyed the hoopla and the whole business. Joyce just didn't have a private life. Uh, and I think uh, Lee just wasn't having as much fun at it. And, and he really did have fun being governor uh, early on. And I think he just found it wasn't as much fun. And part of it was, I'm sure, uh, the economy uh, going to hell and facing the deficit, uh, that had to, had to have some bearing on it. But I think, by and large, you just realized you didn't want to do it anymore. And so you had comparatively smooth sailing. Terry Kohler jumped in at the last minute, but he was not uh, well enough prepared, I don't think. I, I, I don't think that's a mischaracterization. No. He, uh, uh, it would have been a much closer race if the nominee had been Lowell Jackson. Uh, Terry, uh, I think, you know, he thought, well, my granddad was governor, my dad was governor, you know, I can coast on this one. And, uh, of course, he could not. And uh, so, we, although we debated up and down the state, debates were still a big part of the whole business then. But 
there was some real energy on the Democratic side, that, and I was a beneficiary of that. Now, so you, you were the lucky guy who got stuck with the uh, budget deficit. Yeah. Uh, did you think about that when you were first thinking about running? My gosh, if I win and the economy's going into the well, You thing? know, the very good thing about it is this. I knew that we were in terrible shape. And so I'd said from the outset when I was running, I said, if I'm elected governor, uh, I will raise taxes and I will cut services. That's the only way out of this. And so I had said all along that was what I was going to do. And nobody could say, well, you know, you said one thing and did another. And then I knew that I would have a honeymoon of all of about 24 hours. So I was all prepared with a special bill. As soon as everybody said, so help me God, we called a special session. And bang, before people could get cold feet, uh, we passed that tax bill. I was from my first day in office, Tony the Taxer. I understood that. I knew that would come with the territory. Although I don't think ultimately that was what uh, uh, led to my losing four years hence. Uh, I think there are a whole host of others. It didn't help. But by then, we had gotten going again. We had dropped the surcharge on the income tax. Uh, so although some people point that out or make that case, I don't think it was the case. We have a somewhat equal budget deficit today. A billion was a bigger part of the budget then than it yep, is now. Yep. But now we're looking at two point something or if whatever the latest numbers are. Does anybody have the guts today to say, if I'll get elected, I'll raise taxes and cut spending? I don't. <clears throat> Apparently not. I don't think so. I think. It's a real shame that you can't even mention the word tax now. I mean, uh, a budget is revenues and expenditures, and you can't just look at the expenditure side of things. You can't cut your way out of this uh, deficit. Uh, no way in the world. Um, I, I don't know. I'm afraid perhaps not. Uh, some people say and maybe they're right, that it has to be a real crisis before people will bite the bullet and do the right thing. Uh, it's going to be very, very interesting to see what this group that the president has put together with uh, Alan Simpson and Erskine Bowles, what they come up with. And they've telegraphed that it's going to be taxes and expenditures. They're going to go after both sides of it. That's only intelligent, for the love of Pete. And, uh, It'll be interesting to see what What about happens. the argument, though, that you can't raise taxes in time of economic difficulty because people are already suffering? I don't agree with that. I, uh, it depends what taxes you're raising. I mean, you can uh, exempt the kinds of things, for example, we do here in Wisconsin, uh, groceries and the necessities of life drugs. Uh, you can put a premium, you can put a tax on the premium things in life. Uh, and as I I think I indicated earlier, I think you have to recognize that services ought to be taxed as well as goods. And you could probably bring the tax on goods down if you taxed services. Uh, I, I'm a lawyer. I never could understand how legal work was tax exempt, accounting, all of those kinds of things. Uh, and uh, Well, we've had those debates, uh, I remember years and years ago, seeing the list of exactly how much money each, you know, right down to dog grooming. Two million or whatever it yeah, was, yeah. but you know the argument on uh, accounting and, and legal services, for instance, is that the big companies uh, uh, you can outsource them to another state or to India today. Uh, so, yeah, it doesn't happen though. I uh, I think it is it is an inevitability. More and more states are expanding their sales tax onto uh, services, and. Uh, I know I used to hear the argument too, Hawaii was the only state where you could do that and they couldn't outsource it. But you could in today's world. Today's, With computers, yeah, you sure. outsource it anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, but you also reduce taxes, right? Yes. The income tax. Tell us about that. Well, uh, again, I thought, is, and I, I still believe, that if you're going to talk about taxes, you ought to try to redo the taxes rather than just affect the rates. And so we took a look at all of the exemptions, deductions, et cetera, and got rid of a, a whole host of them. On the income tax. Though. Yes, okay. right, yep. And uh, as a result of that, when we came out, we were able to actually cut the rates, have fewer rates, 
and they were uh, cut. Now, I, not huge, not G.W. Bush rate cuts, <laughs> but uh, but they were. So the tax rates were lower when I left office than when I came in. And fewer of them. Yes. Right. Which is exactly what the business community had been asking for. Yep. And which you never we put together a little. <laughs> we put together a little commission headed by a guy named Jerry McGaffey, a tax lawyer, and he came up with all these suggestions how to do it, and uh, we did most of them. You yeah. know, the, we, you were saying earlier about, we were talked earlier about my relationships with the legislature. I would bring legislators into these discussions. I didn't just sit in my office and dream these things up, and uh, it served me in very good stead. How did that work? I mean, going back to the days of Pat Lucy, we wondered what the Pat Lucy treatment was when he would invite a legislator in for a persuasion. I'll ask, uh, since you were on the receiving end of that and then as governor, uh, how, how does this work when, when a legislator is invited in for persuasion? Well, uh, in Pat's case, he, he uh, didn't have a very hard sell with me, truth be told. You know, he wanted me to support uh, merger and I did. One thing I uh, didn't get wholly on board with was the citizen board, the uh, cabinet form of government thing, but uh, he never was heavy handed. Um, I, when he ran, uh, in the primary ran with, uh, ran against David Carley. I had supported David Carley. I know David longer than I knew Pat. I really uh, admired David and I supported David Carley. Well, Pat's elected. I come down for the inaugural, the whole business. Congratulations. He said, I'd like to see you before you leave town. I was going back up. So I went in to see him and I thought, well, he's going to ask me if I'm finally on board. He didn't say boo. He said, I've got a very ambitious legislative agenda. I'd really like to get you involved on the ground floor. I'd like to meet with you on a regular basis. Uh, can I count on you to do that? He didn't ask for any one particular thing. Never. He's never alluded to the fact that I supported his opponent. Hmm. Um, so I, uh, when I would call the legislators in, it was a lot of small talk, frankly. We got along, uh, and I would try to make the sale. But I had uh, very good luck with the legislators. They, they did a lot of unpopular things I asked them to do. They passed a tax increase. They passed a prison for Milwaukee. They passed comparable worth. They passed the community property law. Uh, a lot of uh, things that were, at the time, regarded as toxic by many people. The legislature did it right down the line. And indeed, uh, I ran into an old friend of mine a few years later. Uh, uh, f he was by then a former legislator. And he said, you know, Tony, uh, we got along too well. He said, we should have turned down half those damn bills and you might have been governor another <laughs> term. But. Well, let's talk about some of the controversies. You established a, uh, a gay rights desk, essentially, sure. uh, in your office. Now, that drew a lot of flack, yeah. of course. Well, uh, under Lee Dreyfus, our anti-discrimination laws had been changed. It said you can't discriminate on the basis of sexual orientation. And that's always been interesting to me because there was very little hue and cry over that's it at right. the time. This was about 1980. Yeah, yeah. And Dreyfus signed it, and there were some people that objected, but right. there was no big to-do over it, as right. I'm sure there would be today. Yeah. So, so it was kind of quietly uh, sexual orientation was added to Wisconsin's discriminatory law. But the problem was... Uh, there was no oversight, no enforcement. So that was why I created the commission so that people who had been discriminated against could come to this body and say, I can't rent a, an apartment. I was denied this job. I was passed over for this promotion. And it gave it uh, a lot of visibility. And I think it did clear away the cobwebs, and I think it made the anti-discrimination law work. I, uh, it, was a, it was a grand law, but unless there was some enforcement mechanism, something going on, uh, it was just nice words. You think that was held against you in 86? Oh yeah, I think so. I, uh, I, well, I know it was by some people. It, 
runs fairly deeply. Um, I heard from a fellow in Marshfield, this is a bit indelicate, but the sheriff of Milwaukee County uh, got in real trouble over World Series tickets, and he had to leave. It was, uh, I, the governor gets to appoint a vacancy in that instance. I appointed a guy named uh, Dick Artisan, who was a black man, is a black man. <laughs> uh, and uh, he did a terrific job, by the way, as sheriff. But I was in Marshfield getting gas shortly after that, and the guy at the service station said, you're Earl, aren't you? Yeah. He said, well, you know what they say up here about you appointing that black guy sheriff of Milwaukee County? I said, no, what do they say? You couldn't find a queer. Uh, oh, Jesus. I, you know, I thought, and no, unvarnished, you know, just boom, there it is. And uh, so yeah, to answer your question directly, yeah, there were some people for whom it made a difference. But, you know, in retrospect, I don't have any regrets at all because nowadays, uh, the appointment of somebody of a different sexual orientation in any position of responsibility doesn't get a second thought. But you had a breakthrough that initial. Uh, when I was in the Navy and I was down in the South, I knew that most of the people in the South were not racists. But those who were intimidated the vast majority into silence. And I always thought that was just awful. Until that was broken, uh, the handful of racists would control the dynamic. And I think it was the same thing with uh, anti-gay notions. It's a, it is a minority that really feels so strongly about it. And they sort of cow the majority, not anymore, they sort of cow the majority into silence on the issue. And, uh, you know, things don't change unless somebody makes it change. Another one, sort of related in people's minds, comparable worth. Yeah. That uh, jobs of comparable worth should have comparable pay. That's a great idea. It sounds in the abstract, in the, in the details. Uh, well, tell us about that. Well, it was a, where comparable worth only extended to state employees. I understood that. Now, most of the stuff that's said about it, uh, uh, leaves the impression that it is the law for the private sector. Well, it isn't. And what, what uh, we realized was, and it was because people complained to me, in the state service, take the mental hospital out at Mendota, I don't know if it was this or not, but it was pretty close to it, the janitors got paid more than the nurses. Uh, well, that was awfully wrong. The janitors were all men. The nurses were all women. The nurses had higher education. They had greater demands for skills, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, the janitors were all men. Well, people would say they were the breadwinners. Uh, well, not necessarily. A lot of the uh, women in state service were uh, single, taking care of themselves, or in two-income families. It just didn't hold up. It just reflected the old days when a woman's place was in the home. And uh, at that time, a woman wanted a job. She became a teacher or a nurse. That's about it. That was it. That was it. And uh, they didn't necessarily get paid all that well either. So we did the comparable worth business. I guess, I don't know how it has worked. In state service, I think it has surely worked out. I think the worst of the inequities have been... Uh, have been narrowed. But in the private sector, oh, I guess there's still uh, quite a little bit of it. I mean, the glass ceiling is not just a, uh, a fictional characterization. There is something there. And another one, uh, Mary Lou Muntz and uh, Midge Miller, uh, Democrats from Madison, yeah. uh, pushed the uh, community property, changing yes. divorce to essentially a community property state. That right. was also very, very controversial. And uh, I think, as a matter of fact, that that got more of the old-time people in the business community upset than the other things we've talked about. Because 
up till that point, uh, if uh, the, the husband decided he wanted to get a BMW uh, and went down to Zimbrick and got the BMW, that was it. The, the, the wife wasn't involved in that transaction at all. But if the wife wanted to go to Wehrman's and get a new suitcase or something, her husband had a sign. Uh, she couldn't do it on her own. Uh, well, that was crazy stuff. And, and in Madison, of course, uh, where women aren't going to take it, uh, <laughs> that kind of stuff, there were all kinds of examples kept, kept coming in. Uh, and then the whole notion of at divorce, what happens with the, uh, the wealth or the assets, the resources that the couple has amassed over the time, uh, well, why shouldn't that be half, even though the husband may have been the breadwinner, but the wife was raising the kids, keeping the house, et cetera, et cetera. And it really bothered a lot of people, bothered them a lot. And I was surprised at that. I thought that the equities were so apparent, um, but for some people they weren't. But again, uh, all of the terrible things that were going to happen haven't happened. Uh, you know, the uh, Gay Rights Council, oh my God, we were going to make San Francisco look like uh, uh, a really tough town compared to what we were going to be like. I've heard the early 70s to the mid 70s referred to by, in other states as well, as a window of liberal opportunity mm -hmm. in the political scene. Yeah. That is, especially after Watergate. But at yeah. the time, you had a huge Democratic majority. Yes. Uh, and in fact, the Democrats took the Senate in 74, in the 74 election. Yeah. The Senate for the first time in... 80 some years. 80 years. Uh, so you had that advantage, but doing all of these things, did that turn out to be a disadvantage in 86? Uh, oh, you know, I think cumulatively, it pr it perhaps it did. I remember Tommy's ad uh, was... Uh, a big hand coming out of the sky, dropping a prison in Milwaukee. Well, we should talk about that. Building, once prison again, uh, uh, Henry Meyer was <laughs> not your friend. No, no. <laughs> well, uh, I, uh, and I, I still think it's a scandal in the state today, our whole corrections system. We're the same as Minnesota in terms of the demography, by and large. Uh, population. We imprison, uh, they imprison one-third as many people as we do in Minnesota. They have a lower recidivism rate than we do. It's crazy. We are one of the... And their prison budget is half. Oh, yeah, yeah. And we're right up there with some of the southern states in, ter in, in uh, numbers of people incarcerated, etc. Makes no sense. Well, even back when I was involved, not only did it make no sense, but people were in denial about what the prison system looked like. We had a very large number of the prisoners were African American. None of the staff uh, anywhere were. They were uh, all white, many of them farmers, you know, Wapan, Green Bay, and they were, and the prisons were all far removed. So it seemed to me it would be doing two useful things at once. To put a prison in Milwaukee, where most of the prisoners came from and still do come from, because all the statistics say that if someone's in prison and there's still contact with family and the whole business, the reintegration of the community goes much easier. You can't get people from Milwaukee to be traveling to Green Bay or Black River Falls or Waupun, even Waupun. The second thing was it would give us an avenue to hire a lot of African Americans in the system. To as employees. Yes, right. And uh, Walter Dickey had endorsed it. Many people endorsed it. And He was uh, the correction secretary. Yep. Still a UW professor, I believe. I think he law is. Professor. I think he is. So it, that was a hard sell for the legislature because Henry didn't want it at all. Henry was really adamant. And I tried with Henry you know, you know, where could we put it that won't bother anybody? And, and we ended up choosing a site in the Menominee Valley, which had the big rail marshalling yards, which were in bankruptcy. 
And I went to see the trustee in bankruptcy, who was a former governor of Illinois, Richard Ogilvy. And I said, is there any chance you sell that? What do you want it for? I told him, he said, boy, that's a terrific idea. He said, we'll sell it to you for a bargain price. So I had to persuade the legislature to buy the property. I tromped all around uh, then County Stadium with Bud Selig. Oh, he was worried that people might not come to the ballpark. And I said, we can put it so it's out of no sight lines to the place. He sort of reluctantly said he would go along with it. Uh, the legislature passed it. Um, just about ready to break ground the whole business. And Henry Meyer and Bud Selig and Ray Jackson, who owned a restaurant in the neighborhood, sued. And the basis of the suit was it would cause irreparable financial harm to the city of Milwaukee, to the Brewers franchise, and to Ray Jackson's restaurant. Well, of course, that was all nonsense, uh, errant nonsense. But uh, they succeeded. The Supreme Court threw the suit out, not on that basis, but they, they threw it out on the basis that it was a local act contained in the budget. Well, our argument was, was how we were going to do corrections. And it was we were going to merge, not merge, but put a, build a campus with the Milwaukee County Institution, City of Milwaukee, some other neighboring places, put a courthouse down there where they could take care of all of this. We said this is a part of the overall corrections. No, it was, uh, it was a local act included in the budget. My uh, friend, I can still say it, I guess, Bill Bablich wrote the opinion. And I asked him long after Oh, he can rationalize it. He said, let's not go there. So, <laughs> so it was, it was a, a, an opportunity missed, I think. Um, and then Tommy's television commercial showed uh, a cutout picture of yeah. Wapun right. State Prison coming out of the sky, plunking down right in the parking lot of uh, County Stadium, County which Stadium. was kind of an exaggeration. But it worked, apparently. <laughs> well, and the tagline was, what will he think of next? <laughs> you know, they talked about the comparable worth and some of these other things, but the, the prison was the one that was the uh, the visual. It was a great visual. Oh, though, yeah, yeah. Though, of course, as you say, you were taking care of the sight lines and so forth. It would not have been visible from either the parking lot or within the stadium. No, no. Not Except maybe from Bob Euchre's cheap seats. <laughs> Remember, at, at the time, Bob Euchre was doing a commercial where he was poking fun at himself and right. you know up he had great tickets right and then they, yeah. then they show him <laughs> well we all went up along, there way up there we that was maybe the only place you could see the prison well we went up there i went up there with uh, bud Selig. we went up to the upper uh, grandstand right field corner and uh gosh i had the architects or anything draw what it would be like and what you could see and not see and but it wasn't that wasn't going to, it wasn't going to keep people from the ballpark. Uh, and then we went into a prison building splurge. Yeah, not then. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess it started, with, all the I guess it started with Dreyfus with Portage, but then after, yeah. after this, then yeah. there were even more built. All the wrong places, all remote, uh, and it's going to be hard to get rid of any of them because they're all recession-proof, depression-proof jobs. Jobs for the local. 24 area. hours a day, 365 days a year, and uh, that's not why we ought to have prisons. <laughs> uh, but that's a powerful argument. Uh, you're not going to get people from Black River Falls or Stanley or some of these small places that have them now. They're not going to line up and say, yeah, why don't you... Move Set this. it down and yeah, go somewhere yeah, else. Right. Well, now you also attempted to pass uh, some health insurance reform. Yes. Tell us about that. Right up to date here almost. Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, if, with uh, Linda Rivitz was the secretary of uh, the uh, health, and health and Human Services, I guess it was called. They changed the names all the time. And, and what we tried to do again to start at the state level uh, and hope it would carry over into the private sector give uh, choices of what kind of coverage you would get. And if you chose the least extensive coverage, the premium would be less. And uh, 
Marty Beal and the public employees, for whatever reason, didn't like that. We saved, we did save a lot of money uh, because we put it into effect and it saved a lot of money. But uh, I don't know, I don't know to this day what Marty's objection was, but he organized some rallies on the Capitol Square. And well, the unions traditionally have want the largest possible benefits. Sure, sure. Uh, whether it's the health insurance or other benefits they get with their contracts. Sure. And the, the, our argument was, you know, if you've got a single fella, he doesn't need the expansive uh, kind of coverage that you would give to uh, uh, the breadwinner, man or woman. You know, coverage for children. Whole bit. So you could tailor the policy to fit the, the uh, insured. And I still think that makes some sense, but... It didn't last. It huh? didn't last. And then another one, uh, you spent a lot of political capital getting utilities to have holding companies or allowing them mm -hmm. to. Yes. And it worked with one exception. The notion was this. Uh, everybody talked about um, people fleeing the state. Well, there was one industry that couldn't flee the state, the utilities. And uh, they're guaranteed not to lose money, virtually guaranteed not to lose money. PSC sets their rates and yeah. gives them a guaranteed profit. Absolutely. And uh, the utilities have to build against the coldest day and the hottest day. So they have a lot of money invested that doesn't always generate, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, income when it isn't being used. But they have to have it there. Their argument was if they could use some of their earnings uh, to build other enterprises in the state, they could even that out and it would be job creation. And the first and most successful of them all, of course, was the uh, uh, industrial park down outside Kenosha, which Wisconsin Electric, then Wisconsin Electric, now it's We Energies, I guess, built. And it was and has been an enormous success. Uh, and it worked as the people who are the proponents of it said it would work. But unfortunately, uh, one of the utilities very close to home here got involved in activities that had nothing to do. I, I was a shareholder. Oh. I'm an aggrieved party, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm not neutral on this. My All parents right. had stock right? in Wisconsin Power and Light. Uh. And, of course, people don't buy utility stocks for growth. Yeah. I mean, you buy it for the dividends, yep. right? And that yep. was steady as a rock. Well, then the management of, they changed the name to Alliant, and the management started buying a, a resort in Mexico. Golf courses in Baja, and, California. Uh, uh, phone book company so in I, Iowa. I'm not a fan of utility. <laughs> No, and uh, did you ever did you think that would I be? I never the thought that would happen. I never thought that would happen. I really thought the first one built was, as I say, the uh, industrial park outside Kenosha, and the law price should have been um, more narrowly crafted. But the legislature has never repealed it. They've never gone back. Now I don't know if they've tightened it up or not. It would make sense that they. And once do that. again, in passing that, you angered a lot of Democrats. Oh sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> but as I again I go back to this, most most of the time, most of the time that they got sore at me, it was short lived. Except for Henry, Henry never got over his uh, <laughs> his uh, anger. So then, in '84, uh, I don't know if you uh, some of this was baggage. Tommy Thompson, uh, who was not, I mean, since Tommy has been governor for 14 years. He, he's regarded as an infallible politician, but yeah. at the time he was considered, uh, well, a hick by some of his fellow Recom Re Republicans yeah. even, and yet he, he won. Why? Yep. Well, I think, as I said there, cumulatively a lot of stuff had built up. I think most, the, the most uh, damaging were the social programs, not the taxes. I don't think the taxes helped. Uh, and uh, the, the constant drumbeat from the business community was tough too. Those were the days of Wisconsin has a terrible business climate. Remember the business climate stories? I always talk about the business climate. 
and the Metropolitan Milwaukee Association of Commerce, MMAC, uh, was really tough. They were much tougher on me than uh, WMC. WMC was really, uh, well, Paul Hassett headed it at the time, and they, were re they really were pretty decent, very decent. But WMC and a lot of the business groups really raked it up, and that was, there were, um, what are they called? These, the, f the first phenomenon of these ads that were run not for the candidate, but independent oh, the expenditures. Ads, the issue, yeah, issue ads, ads. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I was uh, on receiving end of some of those. Well, now you've done a couple of things that business really wanted. The, the oh, yeah. Tax, the income tax cuts and the uh, utility holding companies. These were yeah. things that business really wanted. And yeah. yet when the election came up, you know, that's right. didn't but get any support. No, but I didn't do them thinking I would get their support. I guess I thought they might be a little more open-minded about me. But, uh, no, my agenda was pretty much a uh, liberal Democrats agenda. I know when I ran, um, uh, I, in 82, I first met David Axelrod then. He was uh, working for the Chicago Tribune, and he was covering the race uh, between... The, the current presidential. Mm -hmm, yes, he was covering the race for the Tribune between Terry Kohler and Tony Earle, and he, I, he'd he send copies of the columns. And one of them, he said, the 1982 governor's race in Wisconsin is a classic. It's an 1890s Republican versus a 1960s Democrat. <laughs> and he captured it perfectly. <laughs> he captured it perfectly. Well, now, uh, you, well, I know one of your sayings was, good policy is good politics. Yeah. I've always put an addendum to that, quite frankly. It's only good politics if you get credit for it. <laughs> and it, it's kind of struck me that you're a very rare politician that almost thinks it's ungentlemanly to, to toot your own horn. Well, uh, uh, I, I, maybe well, I'm you, wrong. No, uh, no, no. If you have to toot your own horn, you know, uh, I, I made a lot of bad mistakes in the not tooting your horn category. Uh, we never turned out a single press release out of the governor's office. Gee, I, don't, <laughs> I was covering the Capitol, and I No, well, we did do press release. I did uh, weekly press conferences, you may recall. Yeah. Uh, and that wasn't necessarily such a good idea, too. You shouldn't get out there unless there's some news. Uh, and uh, some of the times I got into most trouble were slow news days when uh, your <laughs> colleagues at Somebody the time... decided to make a story. Ah, right? yes, right, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a couple of those where I really got a... Uh, and I asked for it. I was... Uh, but that's... Neil Shively uh, at one press conference... Milwaukee Sentinel report. Milwaukee Sentinel said... Uh, you know, uh, you are, are you not, as governor, this was fairly early on, six months in, you're an honorary member of the Madison Club and Maple Bluff and Nakoma and Blackhawk and Hobbins, but uh, nobody seems, you don't seem to attend any of those places. Go ahead. And I said, no, matter of fact, I, I really don't. Um, well, where do you go? And I said, I'd like to to go down to the avenue. I enjoy the avenue. The avenue down bar there. in Madison. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, you prefer going to the avenue than going to the Madison Club? I should have quit. I said, yes. Why is that? I said, better food and a better class of people. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Madison Club is where the lobbyists and business people hang yeah, out. Yeah, right. The, the, the so, and <laughs> Neil, of course, being a good journalist, uh, wrote the story, and I still give him the business about it. I, I see him at the Avenue every Friday, yeah. as a matter of fact. <laughs> well, I'm wondering if you did get out uh, who you are, because I'm thinking if, if somebody had asked somebody, any Wisconsin resident in 1986, which candidate for governor is the one who goes with the same hunting buddies to the same hunting lodge yeah. to hunt deer every year, yeah. they would have said Tommy. Probably. Yeah, uh, because he cultivated the just folks. He was not a hunter, but cultivated the just folks yeah. image coming from Elroy. I think yeah. people had a, didn't know you. Well, part of it was, I think, I think part of it was that Tommy and Republicans very successfully did it. That I had become a captive of Madison, and Madison 
it used to be Milwaukee, used to be the, oh my God, you're from Milwaukee, forget about it, statewide race. Interesting this year with everybody coming from Milwaukee. From the Milwaukee area, yeah. <laughs> but Madison has assumed that mantle now. Uh, to run for statewide office from Madison is very, very difficult. People, uh, people like the Badgers, uh, but I think they think there are a lot of uh, folks down here whose ideas are, are uh, exotic. So even though you're from the UP and yeah. Wausau, yeah. you got labeled with Madison. I think, I think that's a part of it, yeah. Mm. Well, in fairness to people who did that, the agenda that we had talked about here was largely a Madison type agenda. People in Madison would like that. Uh, now, I didn't do it because I was trying to satisfy the Madison electorate, but it is an agenda that people from Madison would be uh, more comfortable with than, say, people from uh, Peshtigo. Any regrets? Anything in particular you wish you'd No, I guess not. No, I don't think so. It was... Um, as we said at the outset of this discussion, uh, I was the beneficiary of very many serendipitous uh, events. I had a number of uh, extraordinary opportunities that don't fall to many people. And uh, I took the greatest advantage I could of them. And I, no, I don't have any regrets, no. And what have you been doing since? Well, I gave up my license to practice law fairly recently. Uh, I'm on the board of the Center for Clean Air Policy, which was started back when I was uh, in the governor's office. John Sununu and I started, as a matter of fact. Well, the former governor of New Hampshire. New Hampshire, New Hampshire. right. Oh, a very conservative Republican. Yeah, but he was but a guy who liked the environment. Yeah. And I'm on the board of the Joyce Foundation in Chicago, which meets on a fairly regular basis. Uh, so I keep active in boards and uh, go to a few ball games go to the avenue every Friday. <laughs> uh, so I keep very active. Um, I'm sure not just sitting around. What does the Joyce Foundation do? The Joyce Foundation uh, gives away money. Uh, they have five policy areas, environment, education, employment, uh, money in politics, and gun violence. And before the, this last big collapse, their endowment was uh, almost a billion dollars, just short of a billion. It's about 700 million now, but still, that makes a lot of money available to uh, to uh, use for good causes. One of their areas is corrections. No, but that falls in the employment area because one of the programs that we've been doing is to how do you facilitate uh, employment for people coming out. You know, you know, I will get on my hobby horse about that. I mean, it's, it's really awful uh, how difficult it is for people who come out of prison to uh, get back in, to reintegrate in society. Even those uh, who are there for what we would consider fairly modest kinds of things. But if you're a convicted felon, you're a convicted felon by God. And uh, uh, there's no way out of that. Let me ask you about today's media. You were mentioning Axelrod, now presidential aide. Right. A, a, a reporter, the Chicago Tribune today, I doubt would assign a reporter to a, oh. to a, a race in another yeah. state, even a nearby state. That's right. The media doesn't, we don't have the media no. to do that anymore. And that's one reason I think that politics, the civility and all in politics, and the effectiveness of politicians declined. When I was in the legislature, every legislator, every day, looked at the State Journal, the Capital Times, the Milwaukee Sentinel, the Milwaukee Journal, and whatever their hometown paper was. And most of us believe that our constituents were looking at that as well. And everything the legislature did or didn't do was laid out in the paper, and you could go back to it. Uh, there's none of that now. The electronic media for all the wonders of immediacy and all of that business is not good at covering the development of policy at all. I remember one time complaining to Ron McRae that nobody from any that was of your press secretary, yeah, nobody from the uh, no television stations covered the state of the state this year. Ron, he said, Tony, you were competing with a burning barn story out in Barneville. 
you know, and that was it. I mean, I, I understood it. But the, there is a terrible void there. Now, the optimists say, well, sooner or later, the Internet and all that business will fill that void. I don't know. Uh, I thought that the caliber of people who were covering the State House when I was there was very, very good. My gosh, you know, some giants like John Wingard and others. Um, there's nothing comparable now. So the legislature, who holds the legislature as an institution or legislators individually accountable? Uh, and don't tell me it's talk radio. I mean, <laughs> hey, that is... A, I don't know how many years I've got left, but God, I'd sure love to live long enough that talk radio faded from the... <laughs> Well, uh, just to sum it up, uh, what advice would you have for a young person today who might want to get into politics or government? Do it. Get involved. Get involved at the, at the uh, foot soldier level. You'll know in a hurry if you like it or not. Uh, if you do like it and you want to run for something, run for something. City council, school board, town board, whatever. Uh, I think one of the shames of our current decline of of comedy and politics is that a lot of good people are discouraged from getting involved because they say, I don't want to get into that mud fight. Uh, so get involved, and when you see an opportunity, take it. Well, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for giving us this opportunity. Oh, well, thank you. I've, I've enjoyed, enjoyed this it. thoroughly. Thank you. Oh, it's, it's great fun. Uh, an old politician never passes up a chance to tell stories. <laughs> great. Thank right. you. Thank you.